Cool, thanks um, everyone for being here. I wanted to share with you uh, the findings from a small mammal and reptile monitoring program that was uh, done as part of the Bounce Back program in uh, the Flinders Ranges. So the uh, Bounce Back is a composite of um, pest control programs, uh, including um, herbivores, uh, like managing for, uh, stock, feral goats, rabbits, and abundant na native macropods, um, introduced predators, foxes and cats, and managing exotic weeds that have come into the area using a variety of methods. The intention of this program was to allow passive recovery of the landscape, and you can kind of see that in these uh, photos that are just shown on the right there. Um, the general areas that coincide with these activities is highlighted in the, the shading um, and the small mammal and reptile monitoring program in the central and northern Flinders ranges is shown by the pink asterisks. Um, to monitor the small vertebrates, eight trapping webs were installed. Uh, these have 120 pitfall traps along 12 arms. So each arm had 10 pitfall traps placed 10 metres apart. Um, each of the pitfalls were um, made of PVC piping, 15 centimetres in diameter and 45 centimetres deep. So each web covers about three and a half hectares. Um, the particular question I'm going to use this data to investigate is whether or not the removal of livestock has allowed um, these small vertebrates to increase in abundance and richness. So just to show you um, where these sites are located, this is from the northern Flinders Ranges. The um, border for the Volcathonogammon Ranges National Park kind of cuts through the middle. So these two are on the park side and these two are on Wetaluna Station. And just, just to give you an idea of scale, the closest sites there are 450 metres apart. These four sites are from the central Flinders Ranges. So the, the boundary with the Flinders Ranges National Park comes across here. So you have two sites in, in the park and two sites on Gum Creek Station. And those two closest sites in the middle are 2.2 kilometres apart. The dominant vegetation at the sites, as you can see the top photos <coughs> for the northern Flinders Ranges, it's mulga over a grassy understory. And for the central Flinders Ranges, it's primarily Acacia Victoria shrubland over an annual understory, um, mostly a weedy understory. So this program ran from 1997 through to 2011, but stock were taken off of Gum Creek Station in 2008 uh, where these sites are monitoring. So I'm just going to use the two, uh, 1997 to 2007 data. So that's 11 years worth of data. And over that time, 111,218 trap nights uh, were sampled, which is pretty amazing. So 40 species were captured these uh, represent 10 uh, families, um, mainly the skinks, geckos, and dragons, um, and, and not too many different species of desirids or mice, including the house mice, but if you have a look at the number of captures, they're reasonably well represented. So these trapping webs are designed to help you derive an accurate estimate of the number of um, individuals that you have in an area, but a criteria for this method is that you need to have at least 60 individuals of the species that you're interested in. So if you pull all of the seasonal data within each year, you get on average six individuals per species um, fr from, from these data. So it's not enough, not enough capture information to be able to use the original method. So instead, we've, um, I've just pulled all of the sites excluding any animals that were caught more than once, so it's only new captures, and then having a look at, um, in this case, the difference between overall abundance of small mammals and reptiles. So I've also pulled the taxa. You've got the, the grey lines representing the central Flinders Ranges and the black lines the northern Flinders Ranges. The, um, where stock has been removed, it's dashed. In this case, there's no difference over time between the abundance of all small mammals and reptiles. I should have said too that one amazing thing that we've got the opportunity to do is to try and separate out the statistical effect of the removal of grazing from time. 
because we've got this time series of data. So the next thing I did was to have a look at species richness. And in this case, in the northern Flinders ranges, I think reflecting this difference here, there is an overall difference in the number of species once you take the stock off. Um, there are high, there's more species richness in that area, and that's statistically significant. But we can also have a look at community composition, so you can retain all species and abundance data. So each, um, each of these dots is one of the sites at a year, um, and how similar they are in terms of their um, small mammal and reptile composition determines how close those points are in time. We don't want to know all the factors influencing that. We're just specifically interested in is it different from the areas where stock are or stock have been taken off. In this case, it's um, a three-dimensional solution. I'm only showing two of the three axes here, but it illustrates that there, there is a difference. And in, in the case of the Northern Flinders Ranges, that's statistically significant, and it's close to being statistically significant in the Southern Flinders Ranges. So there is, there is a change in community composition once you remove stock. And that um, gives you the chance to actually identify some indicator species. Are there any specific species that happen to be enjoying this change more than others? In this case, it's the pink blotched gecko, um, which was unique to areas where stock have been removed in both the central and northern Flinders ranges. The beaked gecko, which had a disparate um, response, where it's um, unique to areas where stock have been removed in the northern Flinders ranges, but where stock remain in the central Flinders ranges and the bearded gecko, which was only unique to areas where stock remained in the northern Flinders ranges. If we have a look at species specific results, there's 10 common species. I'm showing eight of them. I'm not showing um, house mice or eastern striped skink. And I've included in the pink blotched gecko, which was one of our indicator species from the previous slide. As you can see, over time, the captures for each of these animals is highly variable and their, their low capture abundances. But we can say for the beaked gecko, um, just make sure I don't get this wrong, it was more abundant in grazed areas in the central Flinders ranges, but ungrazed area in the northern Flinders ranges. So this approach is just backing up what we saw on the previous slide. And for the Bollum's mouse and the fat tower donut, both, uh, in both cases, abundance is significantly driven or associated with time. But there's also interaction with time and, and um, the removal of stock. So in areas where stock have been removed or stock remain, there's a different trend or pattern in the change in abundance over time, depending on which area you're in. I think this is an early sign that these guys are more abundant where you have cow cattle or sheep being removed or where cattle um, and sheep are retained, which reflects the ecology of these species. So we've got some results so far, but there's also a lot of variability and it can't help but feel we can't try and get some more results from this. Um, we've also had a look at the temporal effect of that variability, but in space, if you have a look at each of these webs, especially for the central Flinders ranges, you can see how in space, where each of these pits are located can also be quite variable on a site. So we've got ephemeral creeks that are close to some and not others. In some cases, these pitfall traps are located within the ephemeral creeks. You can also see the trees and shrubs that are um, spread throughout the site, which is going to be influencing the microclimate and the understory composition in those local areas. And we know from a lot of work that's been done in the past that these fine scale changes in, in the environment influence a range of small mammal and reptile species. So what we did was to classify very simply the environment at each of these pitfall sites and then have another crack at it. Okay. So it doesn't really matter what, what they are, but on the, on the left-hand side, we've got the microhabitats across, across each here. If you're interested, L is for like loamy soil, S is for sand, um, ephemeral creek, flat, or the slope, and the numbers reflect the vegetation. So three or four, which I think comes up quite often, would be low shrubs or tall shrubs. But what you can see in the case where um, stock has been removed for species richness, um, it's a bit tricky to see. I don't know if you can see it, but there's actually four um, areas that have been shaded green. So this is an increase in species richness with the removal of stock. They're statistically significant results. But in two cases, it should be red shading 
um, their microhabitats where there was actually higher species richness where stock were retained for those microhabitats. And the same thing happens, well, um, similar story with abundance in that three of the um, microhabitats have increased abundance uh, of species where stock have been taken off. But in one case, uh, abundance was higher where stock was retained. So we're having microhabitat specific responses in small mammal and reptile richness or abundance. I can also drill down, oh sorry, before I say that, in two cases you would remember the indicator species story from previously. We can find indicators for two microhabitats, but these are the same species we've already looked at so far. So in each of these microhabitats, you can also have a look for species specific responses, which would give heaps of tables and they have on my computer. I think the easiest way to try and show these results though is to kind of compare how the different an analytical techniques have given significant results for those species. So these species had increased abundance with the removal of stock with the um, Bollum's mouse. There's that interaction term before that kind of indicated that it might be trying to respond, um, but there's not a lot of strength in evidence in the microhabitat scale for northern Flinders ranges. But once we go down into the microhabitat scale, we've got, um, we can detect a significant increase in abundance for that species for the sandy flat tall vegetation microhabitat site. Um, for the pink blotch gecko, we didn't find anything initially. It came out as an indicator species, but once you drill down into this particular habitat type, we've got stronger support for an increase in abundance. So this group of species down here, they've got higher abundance actually where stock remain. <laughs> so the fat-tailed donuts are good little um, opportunistic species. Um, but as you can see, just looking at these three diurnal skinks, they were only picked up at the finer scale of analyses. If we have a look at two other species that actually show disparate responses, so initially it looks like, just get my colours on the printout so that I can make sure I'm telling you the right thing. These guys are actually more abundant where stock are re retained, but once you start having a look at the microhabitat scale, there's a couple of microhabitats where these guys prefer for there to be no stock. They're a bit sensitive to stock in these types of areas. So you can see here that not only is the um, response that you detect dependent on the types of microhabitat types, but also the species. So if we just try and summarise this, we initially started off having a look at the macrohabitat scale and we did find some evidence um, that the removal of stock had an influence on those small uh, vertebrate communities, but we had more evidence once we started drilling down into the microhabitat scale and this evidence was microhabitat specific and species specific. What this gives you is, um, I guess, some good evidence that if you're going to continue doing this sort of work in the future, you'd benefit from targeting your monitoring program in a way that focused on those environments that were likely to be sensitive to your management action of interest and the species within those environments that are also likely going to be sensitive. And at a scale that you're going to detect those changes. So it's, it's quite possible that the web scale, the three and a half hectare scale approach would have been absolutely fine had this environment not been so hammered in the first place. But 15 years on, it's difficult to try and find a response in, in this landscape. So if it had been you know, halfway recovered, it might have been easier to detect a result. But these early phases of um, recovery, um, I think it just goes to show that you really need to be strategic about how you're trying to look for that response in the landscape. I also just wanted to um, highlight the other really obvious result, <laughs> and that is that this program was run for 15 years by a whole heap of people. Well, that's amazing for South Australia. We don't have too many long-term monitoring programs. So, you know, there's been a range of talks um, at this conference about setting up really robust, good science, you know, mo you know foundational monitoring projects. And here's one that people, a whole range of people from the late 80s getting the concept you know, out there through to implementing it have kept it all going. So I think that's a pretty um, amazing result in a way. Thank you very much. <laughs>